Hello, my name's Lorraine Copes and I am the founder of BAME in Hospitality. Today we have the absolute pleasure of being joined by the legend that is Levi Roots. And um, for Black History Month, we have two main themes. We have role models and we have food and heritage. And, you know, Levi ticks the box as far as being a role model. And we also will touch on food and heritage with him. So welcome, Levi. Hi, Lorraine. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm not, I'm not bad at all, as we, we like to say in my part of Jamaica, where I came from, Clarendon. Oh, People yeah. always say, no bad at all. So I, I say, not bad at all, yeah. Cool. And, and how, has, how has life been treating you during this um, very peculiar time that we're in at the moment? Well, Actually, it's it's like a double-edged sword thing because you know um, one end sharp and the other end is blunt. Because on, on the sharp end of it, um, my mom passed away um, right. during that time. Oh, um, yeah. Not not of COVID, COVID or anything, but yeah. you know, just old age. You know, she was in her nineties, um, and you know that that was you know pretty pretty much moved for the whole family during during mm -hmm. that time but on the other hand we within lockdown um my son is seven his name is christopher mm -hmm. and it's just given us a chance to really bond together and i've been enjoying this lockdown with him uh, being with him being able to teach him things that i would never have. we've actually wrote a book together so i can write down all the stuff that maybe you're going to ask me of what i would like to say to him i would have never had the time oh, in any wow. other way to do that to write a book with my seven-year-old child you know to give him all the tips and for him to write down things as well that we've done and the pictures and everything so i don't think i could have ever done the most more amazing thing in life going forward for me and for him and and this is during this time of lockdown so it's that Bridges first is one, you know, sharp with my mom, and the other side is pretty nice and easy and blunt. And I've sat on this sword, and it's just been this sword of COVID, and it's just been yeah. absolutely amazing for, for me and my, my boy. Oh, wow. And um, will it be a published book? Will we get to see, it, or is it is it for kind of family? No, it will be for him. Um, this book is, oh, is just okay. for him. As I said, it's just the messages that I maybe want to pass down to him yeah. and the lessons I want to le learn to teach That's to so him amazing. You know, about himself and about anything that I probably would have wanted my father to have sat down to me and, and, and explain to me. But there was never a COVID or never a time enough for for him to do that. And I realized that I had to capture this time and, and maybe use it, you know, for, for the three of us, me and his mom, to maybe to really just bond first together. Right. And um, COVID is, is managed for us to leap forward many, many years um, in, in what he would have learned, you know, in, in 10 or 15 oh. years. Okay. I, I, we've crammed that within just seven months wow. and put that down in a book. So it's really amazing. Amazing, amazing. And, um, and so what I really want to explore today, Levi, is, is to get to know you as a person, because um, we can absolutely talk about your achievements, which have been um, phenomenal. Um, you know, you walk down the supermarket aisle and uh, you can't but see Levi's name sort of darted around. Um, but what I'm really keen to understand is who you are as a person and, and what keeps you moving on the journey the vehicle that you're on here and here here and today. So, first thing I really want to understand from you is um, what what daily habits or rituals do you have that keeps you focused? I suppose I every day I have one ritual which I you know I I, I just can't leave my house without doing, and that is to make sure I dress well. <laughs> okay. That that is the. Everything else is, is a natural thing because you eat and it's that sort of stuff and you've got to do that. But you don't have to get up every morning and represent, um, you know, who you are, your character, not just for you, um, but for others as well. Um, I'm fortunate enough that I'm blessed that I, I, I'm lucky enough to, to, to know that I am representing others. Mm -hmm. So I put that into my routine as well as in my, even though it's a natural thing, you know, my mom and my dad, my dad always looked great and my mom always really? saw, so I, 
I grew up seeing them doing that. But but for me, since I, I've I've sort of been in the music business and now yeah. you know within within business itself, um, I've taken on this mantle of making sure that I I I, I always look try to look my best, especially for business when I'm leaving my house and I'm representing my brand. So that is my ritual. And the first thing I always choose is a tie. You know, okay. I don't have one now because I'm at home and I'm relaxing yeah, so, on my own. Sure. But um. But, but you know, almost, you know, five days a week, first thing I choose is my tie, and then I dress from, from the tie on the way down, down, down to the shoe. That's my ritual. That's interesting. And I guess, you know, how you present yourself affects how you feel about yourself as well. Absolutely, um, which is what I was trying to say. I, I, I don't think I do this just for me. Because sometimes when I'm just going to the office, for instance, you know, I, I could want to, you know, just put on a normal shirt or something and, and move down to the office if I wanted to. Mm. But 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 I know that what this represents, it, it is much more than that, you know, that's me personally. But I've put my name on tins and on everything and, and this represents the people that when they're buying a bottle of sauce or a bottle of drink or meal or whatever yeah. with the name Levi Roots, they are investing in the brand in, in, in me to, to represent who I am. Mm -hmm. um, so I always try to know that they're paying one pound fifty or one forty nine yeah. for, yeah. for a bottle of sauce, and I'm going to make sure every time they see me, I, I represent that. And because it's me, I enjoy it. So it, it's not a point that you're pretending to be someone else. Yeah. This is me, my roots. So, you know, everyone knows me who I am, and I think in business, that's what my greatest lesson or teaching is: be who you are, yeah. because it's always easier than pretending to be someone else. Oh. And, for me, it's quite easy because that's me. And so on that then, so, I mean, authenticity is something that has always come across very strongly, you know, as, as I've witnessed your career. Through yeah. That. How, how, how were you able to, to, to start and continue from a really authentic space, given that you were in many ways the first to do, you know, many of the things that you've achieved? Authenticity, that, that, that is broad. Um, if, if you're talking about as a personal authenticity, mm. as me, as I says, you have to chisel that out from you are very young, mm. or you have to be born with it naturally. Some people say you can be born an entrepreneur, others say you can learn to be an entrepreneur. Mm. I'm the latter because I know that I was never you know, born to be, as a matter of fact, I, I couldn't count to 10 until I was perhaps 12 years old. Mm. Um, I couldn't spell my first name, which only had five letters yeah. in it until I was in secondary school. Okay. So, and it was very difficult for me. So I knew that I, I was born, but you are made an entrepreneur. You are turning to who you are based upon those that were around you. Mm. And and my, my mom was around me a lot and she's very lucky in a real mind minded um and and so i i sort of draw you know from her earth seed on on, on that so the authenticity is, is me but if you're talking about authenticity when it comes to the food and how do i remain you know mm. authentic i'd say i try not to be if that makes sense yeah, it does. because i try to sell levi roots i don't try to to, to say that i'm selling you everybody else's version of caribbean yeah, sure. food. Because oh. Caribbean food is so wide, it's absolutely impossible. I know we all think of it as Jamaican food mm -hmm. because you know, you know, all the takeaways were around. And so yeah. when non-Caribbean yeah. people yeah. absolutely when non-Caribbean people think of, of Caribbean food, they will associate it with Caribbean takeaway as Jamaican thing and all yeah. that. But it is it's thousands of islands. So it's very difficult to be authentic in that respect. Mm -hmm. So I try to be going back to what I was saying originally, authentically Levi roots. Mm -hmm. so, so this is how I try to remain. And because that's easy, as I've explained before, for me, you know, the world is my oyster to express myself as a, mm -hmm. as a Caribbean person and to double or to make versions of, of, of what's already there, my versions of them and, and present that to the British public. Nice, nice. And so tell me, um, you know, you, you've been in the public eye for, for a, a fair amount of time now. And um, I think we all recognise um, sometimes the, the gift and the curse that that can present. How do you look after yourself 
because um, you know being in the public public eye can come with huge amounts of pressure as well. How do you look after Levi? I think there's one lesson that I've learned is to is to have less people around you um, when you when you get through these doors that you know you're always begging for and you're praying somebody please open this door and let me and I can be good when I get in that was me you know <laughs> in business uh, trying to sell my sauce and saying to every yeah. bank manager that I ever met let me in you know I, I can be good man once I get in I just want to get in there mm. and when I did get in mm. I realized that I had to shed a lot of the stuff that I perhaps would have brought with me, mm. you know, um, and, and, and have less of that. Yeah. Because less is more, but it depends on, on the less. So yeah. I, I kept those that would be benefit. I kept those ideas and friends and that would be beneficial to me when I, when I am in those rooms. So in some other ways, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, I keep going is having less people around and less friends, but the one that I do rely upon, you know, are ones who are beneficial to me. Um, and those are like families and close friends that even if they can't give you or do anything for you, just the safety to know that you've known these people for, you know, yeah. zonkies of, of years, yeah. you know, yeah. brings clarity and, and brings friendship and, and everything else. So it's just the weed out, you know, a lot of that. Um, and everyone knows me, I travel alone. When people see me, you know, I mean, I'm from Brixton, from Cox's Sound and from everything that seems to want to be blurring and out there because that's that's my background and that what's the name represents and the raster image and everything it feels like that's how it should be you know wherever i am you know these big splits flowing and everything like that <laughs> and, and what <laughs> <have you. laughs> But, but it's absolutely not the case. I think when a lot of people see him, he's that suited and booted yeah. guy in his purple suits and do this and do that yeah. and that. Because that is the true me. And that's mm. because I've actually shelled off a lot of that to be able to, re to remain who I am. Sure, sure. And um, so, so what keeps you motivated then? Fear of failure. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, really? Uh, that one is easy. Oh boy. You know, as I say, I, I realize the cap that I wear, you know, that it's not just me under that cap. It's not just my head. You know, it, it's a lot of head on, on the, on, under that cap. Um, and, and, and I know my people, you know, I, I, because I am one of them. Um, and normally, you know, when one of us gets there and be up there, you know, we, we support that, you know, and, and we're there with them because I feel the love and everything and all that. Um, but but I also read Shakespeare and I know what he says about suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Yeah. And 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 that means that, you know, once they're lifting you up there, you know, if you ever make a slip by hook or by crook or whatever, and yeah. you slip down. Nobody's catching you while you're falling. Oh, you sure. know, you slip right down, right down right onto bottom. So I, I'm aware of that. And it's that fear of mm. they're holding me up there because I can feel the love at the moment. Um, but for me, it's just to keep on on, on being me, you yeah. know, which yeah. is difficult at times. You know, yeah. as I said, it's easier being you. But once you get into these rooms, then it becomes a bit difficult. It's not that easy because sometimes, you know, you do have, have to bargain and you do have to maybe compromise yourself a little bit and that sort of stuff in those rooms, in big businesses. But the main thing is that when you come out of that, you have to you have to be satisfied with what with those decisions, decisions that, that you make. But I've learned that just by having, you know, those less people and those valuable ones around me. Sure, sure, sure. And so talk to me about those environments then going into those rooms. What sort of mindset do you adopt prior to going into those rooms? So what's in your head? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like a chameleon, you know, um, it's, it's every territory, every step, you know, that this seemingly lazy lizard, you know, as, as my son calls him, you know, because he just he's not even sure if he's going to step yeah. <laughs> you know, the chameleon is he's, he's, he's that. And, and you have to, whatever step he steps, he, change, he changes himself to, to adapt and blend in, to fend off, you know, whatever predators is there. He's still him, 
you know, the lizard, the slow moving lizard with the long tongue and everything. But he knows that he's in all different kind of territories and everything is coming at you. So you have to be able to adapt to that. And I think most animals in nature, you know, brings this same sort of defense mechanism to, to themselves, or they have one. That is my defense mechanism. When I'm in these rooms and talking to whoever it is, you know, that, that I'm, you know, maybe chatting to or helping out doing my time doing charity work or, or whatever, it's being able to be adaptable. Yeah. You know? Being able to understand whatever language you've been spoken in yeah. without knowing it. If you see what I mean, mm -hmm. it's without it's being able to dance to whatever music you hear, it's being able to understand any conversation that you that that, that you that comes at you. And it's just being adaptable and still being you, which is something that we we fear a lot of the time. Because we fear not being ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because we feel that if if we're not being ourselves, it's it, it's a sellout and that sort yeah. of stuff. And, and I felt that for many years, especially being a raster man. Yeah. Because this is a journey that I've been on longer than a lot of people that's been on this now. Because I've been a raster man ever since I was I was 18. Have you? I'm in my 60s now. Okay. And these are the battles what George Floyd, everything is all this about rastas is to ever think in concept. Yeah. That's what we stood for. That's yeah. why you know people were trimming rastas and murdering them in Jamaica, the yeah. police and the government and everything like that yeah. in, in the 40s and 50s, because they, they stood for that. So my journey is a long one to be able to say you have to be adaptable because now rastas don't only look like they looked before. You know, Rastas looks like me now. Rastas are doctors, they're lawyers. They, <laughs> they're not in the day when you saw them smoking weed and looking like, you know, the Mormons yeah. back in the days in Africa, which is what they were fashioned on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, Rastas are different. So it's just being adaptable. So I am still that Mormon Rasta man. <laughs> but I'm adaptable. When you see me in my bling and my this and that, my heart beats in that same, that same fashion. But I try to represent for these people, you know, that I can I, I can be this chameleon when I'm in this room. But what I'm doing, I'm extracting the information to be able to come back and say to my people, that this is what Peter Jones was saying when he was talking to me about expanding the source of America. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that kind of information I want to extract. And being able to do that. It's just being a chameleon and just being able to adapt to the ones you, you get into. These sure, ones. sure. I mean, it's interesting you talk about the, the Rasta man, um, like, you know, the, the history of, of Rastafarianism. And I remember my mom telling me that when she was growing up in the 60s, um, that um, her parents would warn her, you know, not to bring a Rasta home. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, it, it, it was a real thing, <laughs> you know. It's yeah, it still was, and it was because of these messages. We we were saying that we're not comfortable with what you know, with what the stereotype, yeah. what people was throwing at people, oh. and we wanted to have our own image of Jesus and, and our own this and that. Yeah. And so we choose Emperor Haile Selassie to say that he's our inspirator, whether you love him or you like him or not. He was a black emperor, you know, and we chose him as our leader, as opposed to saying that you know, with this blue-eyed blue-eyed Jesus that, that was throwing at us when I was a kid, yeah. that my mom had on the wall and we were expected to do that. I removed that and I said, no, I want to put this black emperor out there to represent, mm -hmm. to represent me. And so, you know, these battles is something that as a restaurant we've been fighting a long time. But, you know, for us now, it's great to see that young people are now, you know, fighting and it's black people fighting, it's white people, all that now yeah. is, is the same actions. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. I think, um, when I think back to June and, you know, what I describe as an awakening for some, um, that, you know, everything that you've seen globally, it's collective, collective unity and all people um, fighting and, um, you know, really pushing for change um, and not though solely the marginalized, which, which fills me with hope for change in the future for sure. And so you touched on earlier about the book um, that you've written for your son. Yeah. So looking back then at your career to date, and is there a single, is there a single lesson that you would have told the younger Levi that has really benefited you today? Time is short. 
that that's one of the the stuff that I was concentrating on with him and tried to explain that at, at the age of seven I'm trying to explain to him and you know but I knew that we were writing this down so even though he doesn't get it now he probably will get it in a couple of years time you know when he's yeah. 10 and so and so move and so but you know for me it's, it's that key thing I wish somebody had explained to me you know how important it is you know, for you to take in this information that is there for you. Yeah. You know, that life is short. Mm -hmm. We always think that life was so long when we were young. You know, we, we are like that. Even, I remember even when we used to get school holidays, you know, you know the summer yeah. holidays. Summer holidays felt like a lifetime. Yeah, I don't remember. School. It felt like, and you wasted it. Yeah. You absolutely wasted it because it felt so long, you just felt nothing. And nobody was there to tell you things like, you know, like the time with me and my son is just done, that period, you know, of doing it. It would have been impossible then for anybody to think that doing that amount of thing, because normally you would sit that out and doing that in four, five, six years. Yeah. But it's to understand, you know, when you're younger, how that is important for you to take this information is now, because it's not that long. Because before you know it around the corner, when you're in your teens, you've left school, you've left school, college and you're in university now waiting to become a man have children and, and you know and life and then life at the end of it seems now it's on a downward spiral so it's really important for it for him for me to teach him how important it is that you know he has to take this information in now and how important for me to be able to pass that information to him in quick time and being able to advance into that you know as the days and the weeks and the years go go on so that it becomes shorter for him to learn these lessons within that so i've actually i've done with him what i would have wanted someone to explain explain to me because i wasted a lot of years that I, I can admit that and hold my hands up that yeah. maybe if i could have concentrated better when i was younger i could have given my other children a better life and taught them the lesson Sure. But when I was a father back then, I started pretty young. I, I didn't have, I didn't have anyone to sort of guide me in that direction mm -hmm. before. But I, I give thanks now that that I do have that time, and I've made sure that I've used it with him, not yeah. to make that mistake around again. Yeah, yeah, nice. Okay, and as as we're on that note, um, I want to talk to you about mentorship, and the, the part it's played um, within your life. I mean. We here um, at Bayman Hospitality recognize the power of mentorship. We have a, a, a mentorship scheme called Elevate Mentorship, um, which is created to accelerate careers. And so, so talk to me about passing those nuggets of knowledge and what mentorship means to you personally. Well, mentorship is a bit like, it's like the angels on the shoulder, isn't it? You know, you know that one that is sits on, 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 yeah. on your shoulder. I don't know whether it's left or right the angel. Perhaps the angel will sit on, her, on the right side. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's it for me. Is and, and the angel would never give you bad advice because that's not what angels do. You know, <laughs> everyone's knowing that one is that on the other end would be the the devil or the, yeah. the bad advice, yeah. you know, which way you take it. So for me, that would be the mentorship, the, the, the angel on the shoulder that's there all the time. You know, every time you want to, you, you get to a point in business or in your business plan when you're young and you started out and you, you have the idea because that's the first thing you start with. Because yeah. without that, don't even bother thinking of starting. Yeah. So get the idea first. So once you get that, the next thing is to be able to have all your questions answered from a trusted voice yeah and this is where the angels on the shoulder and the shoulder come comes to and that's mentorship because it's finding that person within the within that scope of business you know i mean even though a mentorship can come in all different fashions yeah, definitely. because i put my mother down as one of my greatest you know, really? mentors, and she was never a business person yeah, cool. at all yeah. um so it doesn't it doesn't really matter about that but what i'm saying is for your business plan specifically you need to find someone that who maybe who has the knowledge of the type of business that you or the market that you want mm -hmm. to go into. And they becomes that angel on, on the shoulder because you have to trust them wholeheartedly. And, and it's going to be somebody that you can ring up at any time. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and that's what you know, mentorship does. 
Um, for me, it was about a lady called Nadia Jones when I started out um, in Brixton, lovely Jamaican lady. Um, it, uh, when I you know, left my job, I was working in a, in a place called Plum Base just before Dragon's Den. Um, mm -hmm. as, a, yes, as a plumber's yard, it's warehouse man. Mm -hmm. After giving up on the music and I wasn't making any money in reggae and, you know, I decided to get a proper job. <laughs> um, and while I was in this plum based place, the inspiration to do the sauce game, thinking that, you know, a few years ago I was on stage with Luciana, Sizzler, blah, blah, and here I am working in a bloody plumber's yard. What's mm -hmm. that about? Mm -hmm. So I just took off my jacket one day and said, you know what, thank you very much, manager, but I'm going to do back, back into music but I'm going to merge my sauce now, my, yeah. my sauce now with it. And then I just left that job. I just, you know, just, really? I just spiral and just ready to start within my business now. And I just walked straight into this lady's office in Brixton, Nadia Jones. And when I went in, I had the sauce that I'd made, a, a bottle of it that I'd made, and I had my guitar. Yeah. And um, and I explained to her that I wanted to put music and food together, and yeah. she got it straight away. And mm -hmm. out of all the people then that I've met, you know, during my time of trying to market the sauce, yeah. none got it like Nadia. Really? She totally understood what I what, what I was saying. So I rely immensely on her. And as a matter of fact, she was the person who actually gave me the the address and told me about the rural food market, which is where Dragon then discovered me. Okay. Um, really? Because she would send me, or every week I would, or every other week I would go to her, and she would send me to these food places in in the shires and in some weird places, and I wouldn't make no money and everything. So I, I was go to her and I said to her, Nadia, look, you know, every, every week you're sending me to these places, I'm not making any money. Why are you doing this? She says, Keep going, Levi. Bring your guitar. Bring your sauce. Don't sell the sauce. Sell you. <laughs> So I and so I just kept going. Wherever she sent me, I, I went, you know, went to Wales, Scotland, wherever. These yeah. sauce, these um, little farmers markets where these white people would be, and there's no black people looking like me and all the kind of things there. And I was suffering that until I went to her one day. She says, and I was gonna, just as the word was gonna come out of my mouth saying, Nadia, no, I'm not going. She says, Here you are. And I looked at the paper and it says the World Food Market in the Excel Center. In in, uh, in East London, yeah. Um, and she says, "Off you go," and I took the, the the card she gave me with a frown still, and I still yeah. went. And it was while I was there, wow. Uh, the, the the producer of the show Dragons then saw me selling the sauce and doing my thing, and mm -hmm. she was the one who came over and says, "Levi, would you like to be in Dragons then?" Mm -hmm. And I turned around and I said to her, "Excuse me." I'm not interested in that because I never knew what the show was about. I oh, never heard of it. It's like somebody had mentioned some strange things in my head, and I was thinking, I'm not really interested in that. And uh, I want to do maybe this. the dragon in the title was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she gave me the card, and I took the card. So that's the mentorship part of, of things. It's trusting that person who knows business. Because the reasons why Nadia was sending me all the time to these places, it wasn't about making money. She was saying, get yourself known. You don't need to be known in Brixton and these places yeah. where you already are. Yeah. Caribbean people now go buy, not gonna buy no sauce from no guy from Brixton and he don't have no connection with it. They rather buy authentically from there or they make their own. Mm -hmm. So she said she was saying to get out of Brixton, go mm -hmm. where these mainstream people are and make your name amongst them. And so, but of course, then as a young, you don't really understand it until after a while you do it, you start to see how much people start to appreciate you yeah. outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And that's how I managed to stick with it for a couple of years wow. until finally, you know, it worked for me. So that's mentorship, man. It's, it's the, she was the, the angel on my shoulder telling me every time when I tripped over and that, that you're good. Yeah. It's not about the sauce. That's not why you're doing it. The sauce yeah. is good. Sell yourself. It's about Levi Roots. Mm -hmm. So again, I say to people out there, man, get yourself your own. Your Absolutely. Own wow. And so fast forward then to current day. <laughs> and um, it's been a it's it's been a journey. I think to describe it as a journey is probably underselling it from my part. But um, you know, you you've you've been able to um move mountains in many ways just as far as how 
Caribbean food, um, Caribbean condiments, con uh, Caribbean ready meals were, you know, previously absent, pretty much absent from the retail space within the UK. Can I ask what the single, the, the, the thing that you're most proud of, what would that be? Wow. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I remember a few years ago, the mayor of Brixton um, called me out, um, you know, and said, yeah, Levi, you don't come down, we're going to give you the keys to Brixton. And I'm like, Lord of mercy. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you grew up in, a, in your area. You you are not a hero as far as you remember because you know I've done so much bad things back then when I was a kid growing up because of the environment where, where you live in. And and here was this man calling me out that wants to give me the keys to Brixton. I'm like, so when we got so I got there now, um Electric Avenue, yeah. the famous street in Brixton, and the mayor is there, photographers and people are getting around and everything. And the mayor stood up and made his speech. And then just before that, he turned to me and gave me the mic and he says, oh, Levi, what would you like to say except in the keys? And I had this big key. I still got, I've got it somewhere actually. I mm -hmm. wish I could find it to show you. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me, one moment, get the key. Yeah, got it, yeah. Because <laughs> my son, my son, my, my son plays with it a lot. Here it is. Oh, wow. That's a big key. <laughs> yeah, it's a single. <laughs> no, my son uses like as a. As I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so the mayor gave me the keys and I and I took the mic from the mayor and I remember specifically saying, you know, I took the mic and I said, I said, Your Excellency, thank you very much. I'm really proud to be um, offered this wonderful um, statement here. But do you realize that I've actually burgled every house in Brixton? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I laugh at it now because there yeah. is humor in there, but there's also yeah. seriousness as well, too. <clears throat> because what I was trying to say to the mayor and everybody that was in the sun, you can change. Mm. You can come from where you have come from because many of the people that stood on Electric Avenue that day when he was doing that knew of my escapades back then yeah. when I was younger, yeah. running around Brixton couldn't get a job, like many of the youths them now in the streets going around and stuff like in gangs and stuff. That's my territory, you know? That's my life. Most people that knows of my life know that it wasn't pretty, pretty like <laughs> Dragon's Den before. It was those days in Brixton when Brixton was a no-go area. You could not get a job if you had an address in the 70s, living in Brixton, Acre Lane. Yeah those kind of places, Atlantic Road mm -hmm. around. You had to give your address like as Herne Hill, which is the leafier part of Brixton, yes. because it was really, it was really tough. So when I said that to the mayor it was, and to the people, it was really saying that you can change. And if you're looking for some example of what change is, see me up, because I know where I'm coming from because I worked hard for it. It's not accident. I wasn't just plucked out and dragged it then and then all given this for Mr. Nowhere or, or what have you. People here knows my journey. Mm. They know where I've been. So for you, for, for the mayor to be saying to me, here is the keys to Brixton, I had to let you know and let the people know from my heart that I am aware of my own journey. So I'm not just taking it and saying to the people, oh, well, thank you very much, but I've got some things to hide here and things like that. I'm taking it and saying, here's my life. And do you still accept me? You know, and I'm always grateful for them that says, yeah, it doesn't matter what, you know, you're done in the past. You are who you are now. And that was the message. So to answer your question, that must have been one of my greatest, you know, yeah. effects when things happen so far for the people of Brixton, my own people who yeah. knows of my frailties and everything yeah. um, can, can say, you know, you are one of us and we respect for who you are. You don't get that easily. You absolutely don't. I know you can get it from elsewhere because people don't know you and they'll always just celebrate you just because of the, the outer, the outer shell that they see. But when your own, you know, um, do that, they're doing it from the inside. So I'm going to choose that as, as one of my, my greatest moments. That's amazing.
as we kind of wind up um, our, our chat today, which has been super insightful, I want to talk to you about food. <laughs> food oh, is, oh, yeah. <laughs> the first question on food is, so when you think back to, you arrived in the UK at age 11, at around 13, 14, what was the food that you longed for the most that you were not having at home, uh, were not having in England? Was it, it was it was fresh food. It was it was fresh fruit and vegetables. Yeah. And as a young child, that's what I that's what I missed. The other stuff, you know, again, you, you don't really think of that because you eat that when you're given. But where I come from in Jamaica, Clarendon, an idyllic place, is you know lakes and jumping fish out of lakes, and every tree has fruits on there. <laughs> every tree has some kind of fruits that you can eat in Clarendon, in Canton, where, where I'm from. So, and so that's what I missed as a, as a kid. It was just being able to just uh, run down the street and just grab whatever I grab and put it in my mouth. Whether it's mango, oranges, whatever, you know, that's a, it was that kind of lifestyle. So I missed that because when I got here, no trees had fruits, absolutely. And it was winter, yeah, it's like the, tree, the trees had molted. And I never knew about malted trees because I come from every green place in the, in the Caribbean, every, every year around the trees are green. Mm -hmm. And I came in winter and I just couldn't understand it. It looked like a petrified forest, you know, with these scary fingers and hands. And it, it just looks gloomy when you sort of, when I was coming through from the airport with my, with my parents. So, so that's perhaps what I missed of all is, is, is the fruit and veg and is the freedom of being able to pick it and actually eat yeah, it. I can imagine. And so what's, what's your favorite food of your heritage and why? Oh, Lord of mercy. <laughs> there is a lot. Is there? I've, got, I've, I've always chosen ackee and saltfish. Okay. Because that reminded me of my grandma. Um, and, and that's so easy because most of the thing, apart from the salted cod, we grew in our garden mm -hmm. um, when, when we were children growing up. It was just the fish that we had to get. And it's only if you wanted to use salted cod because you can make aki with, with other things. You, you know, even now I I make aki for some people and I don't use fish. I use make sometimes mushrooms and um, I replace the, the salt fish okay. with the mushrooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but that 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 would be my you know my my favorite because it's so easy. And as I said, most of the things you could grow, you know, and buy the fish and. And, and everything else. The, the aki tree in Jamaica is one that is in every garden as a, as a aki tree is in, oh. there, is in there. So yeah, I'll choose that. Well, it's one of my favorites too. Um, final question for you, Levi, is, is what's coming up? What's what's next for Levi Roots? Oh, it's gonna be about the film, isn't it? It's the, it's the movie. Yeah, the movie, the Levi Roots, the movie, which, you know, I'm, I'm so excited about as you can imagine. Um, I can't hide the excitement. I think there's probably the, a movie made about your life and me turning up at, um, you know, at, at the opening night on the red carpet, you know. <laughs> uh, these are the visions I, I, that I have of it. So it's just absolutely amazing. So we're working on it at the moment. We're writing the script, you know, we've got a long way. I'm working with some top people and I can mention that, that I'm working with a, a fantastic um, screenplay writer, one of our best black writers that I, you know, we chose specifically because he'll be able to tell my story. His name is Roy Williams. And anyone in the business of theater at the moment you ask about this gentleman, yeah, they'll tell you that it's amazing that I've managed to get him to help me to put the story together from my book into film because, you know, I've written the book, but, um, but now this is taken from the, the, the book, the, the film script. So it's that, and then, you know, early next year, hopefully we'll be choosing actors and yeah. um, locations um, and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> amazing. Wow. <laughs> that, yeah. So, so I know you, you're quite early into the process, but do you know um, when it will when it will be released for cinema? Are we looking like 2022 or? Yeah, yeah 20, 20, 20, end of 2021, 2022. Um, it will take about a year in, in the in the council. I said we've, we started, but well, COVID has kind of put us back because we did. We started the story well before mm -hmm. March, and um, now we are six, seven months, you know, behind. So we've got to put that, throw that into the, into the mix as well. But um, no doubt that you know we'll finish the script, you know, this year before Christmas, and then next year is when we actually start, you know, the, the shindig of choosing who will play me and- Well, I was, and that's what I was just about to ask you in terms of um, 
the, 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 the actor that will play you. I'm sure you, you'll be uh, looking very closely to, to ensure that he's a true representation of you in all your glory. So I'm sure that will be an interesting process. Yeah, it, it, it will be exciting. Um, but I'll try, you know, not try. I think I, I won't have any real, you know, um, choices to make in those respects because, you know, it, it's not like we're making a, a video or anything like this. is a multi million yeah. pound movie. And, the, you know, the directors and that sort of stuff, they are the ones who would be able to, to recommend um, to me a, a few actors would be able to, to, um, to, to play. To play me, and I'm just gonna say, make sure that I'm tall, I'm sexy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it, it'd be great, it'd be fantastic. I'm just so excited just to know that it's happening. And, yeah. and I think we have a wealth of British actors here, yeah. Nowadays, when we talk about actors, even in Hollywood, yeah. when we look at a lot of the films and that are coming through, it's not Hollywood actors. I mean, I even saw an interview with um Samuel L. L. Jackson. He's complaining that you know that too much British actors are over there. Yeah. yeah, so we we will be able to have a wealth of talent to choose from to be able to. to um, Agree. Movie. Agree. Exciting times. Brilliant. Well, Levi, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, it's been wonderful getting to know you, understanding more about your journey, your inspirations, and also about uh, the the movie that will be sitting tight. Um, and, and really looking forward to. And so I want to wish you a wonderful week. Thank you again for your time. And um, we will speak to you soon. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Have, have a great week, yeah? Yeah, you too.